There's a phrase that's become popularized in our culture. You may have used it in some context. If not, I know you've heard it. Lean in or lean forward. It's used in business contexts at times for when you're trying to encourage uh, a group to lean in with interest toward a particular objective, toward a particular new idea or concept, or just to kind of get people involved. Lean forward in your chair. Show interest. Show diligence. Goals and objectives or quests are things that we all have in life. Well, today I want us to, as we continue to think about the overall concept of discipleship, I want us to think about learning forward. Now, you know when someone has leaned forward, you can tell. But you know, you can also tell when someone's learned forward too. Because they're growing. They're moving. They're not moving back, falling back. They're not staying where they are. They're, they're moving forward. And we need to learn forward in relation to this whole concept of discipleship. This morning I'll end our brief initial 2018 series on discipleship. But as previously mentioned, I plan to revisit this topic all through the year and at least once per month. So we'll be trying to encourage each other and check on how's it going and have specific objectives and specific ideas as to how we might be better disciples encouraging each other. So today, let's learn forward. I believe in the old adage, if we're not growing, we're dying. I believe that. That's biblical. That's biblical. If you're not growing, you're dying. Yet, growth is hard. Now, there was a time when I was really young that I was not as high as I am now. Well, I'm not as wide either, but uh, <laughs> specifically thinking about my, my height. And I remember at one particular time just wanting to will myself to be taller. Maybe you have had that similar sentiment. Oh, just come on. There wasn't any pain involved in that. But there's pain and sacrifice involved, and it may not have been as successful as I wanted it to be either. But when we're wanting to grow in any aspect of life, there is sacrifice and pain involved. It takes our time, it takes our energy, it takes effort. It takes unlearning some things and relearning other things or learning other things brand new that I haven't yet had placed before me. But you know, there is a difference between contentment and complacency. Sometimes that's challenging for us. We should be content in our relationship with the Lord at where we are at the moment in our lives. This is where I have grown to. This is where I am. I need to, to have a sense of contentment in that. And yet, that contentment should not cause me to be complacent with where I might be able to go in relation to my growth in the Lord, in my knowledge, in my service, in my abilities. You remember what Jesus said to the congregation at Laodicea? In Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now there's you an image. And I just really just want to ask this of you right now in your discipleship. Do you make Jesus sick? Do you? Do you just make him nauseous? Because you're not on fire for the Lord? Well, I'm not cold either. I'm just kind of wishy-washy. I'm lukewarm. Here's Jesus' reaction to lukewarmness. I don't want that, do you? We don't want to make that reaction from Him. So we need to work hard. 
There are many excuses why we fail to learn, change, and grow. Number one is, it's just easier to stay where we are. That's easier. It's more comfortable. But everything we've ever learned in our lives was new to us at one time. Tying our shoes, learning to walk, learning to talk, riding a bicycle, so many other things. At some point, sadly, many of us reach a point where we feel that we've had enough experiences, enough knowledge, enough new things, and we just rock along in life doing just as little as possible. And so therefore, and I, I say this all the time, hey, what's new, Jeff? Not much. <laughs> now, that's just kind of a standard response that we use with each other. How you doing? All right. Anything new? No. Nope. Again, I'm not critical of that necessarily. But if you really bore down to the content, there ought to be something new. There ought to be something vibrant. There ought to be some, some growth. One thing we're going to expect to see in the next few months, and I'm excited about it, is spurts of green that begin to form on these plants out here and on these trees. Leaves are beginning to bud. There's new growth taking place. Now how? We would know something was wrong if that didn't happen. There's also something wrong if it doesn't happen to us spiritually. There's something wrong. There ought to be life there that is evidenced. This impacts marriage and relationships when there's not a, a vibrancy and a, and a life that is attached. It impacts our work when there's no interest in developing new skills, new techniques. Eventually, your livelihood can become threatened. I had a good, have a really good friend years ago, uh, and some of you will know who I'm talking about, who also knew him, who saw his business shrivel right in front of his eyes. He was a typewriter repairman. <laughs> He didn't have any other skills. And he didn't have any interest in learning any other skills. But you know, that business kind of went away, didn't it? <laughs> it just did. It certainly impacts our relationship with God. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, and that is by those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Toward the end of Camelot, a depressed King Arthur asks the sage Merlin what to do for his sadness, to which Merlin enthusiastically replies, learn something new, my boy. Learn something new. Now we shouldn't be interested in change for change's sake, or change the devil wants to authorize in our lives in any particular capacity. Our new progress will be based on an old standard. New growth on the plant that has the same roots and the same soil. We're not looking to have a completely different plant, but he expects when he walks by our lives each day to see some fruit. You know what Jesus did to the tree that had no fruit when it was time? Let's not let that be an occasion for us. Let's be blossoming and blooming and producing in our discipleship because we love him. That's why, because we love Him. A couple of things to suggest. One is, as we learn forward, we need to learn about ourselves. No greater example than in Moses. You remember the, the famous story. God called out to Moses from a burning bush to go back to Egypt and to lead the children of Israel to freedom. He was 80 years old. Granted, living was longer then, but 
He still was a very mature man at 80 years of age. Had been a shepherd for 40 years. You know, I think probably Moses had in mind, this is what I'm going to do. Whatever time I'm left, this is what I'll do. And yet on that particular occasion, God made him very aware that he had a mission for him. Your discipleship following me is going to require you to go somewhere and do some things that you probably can't even fathom at the moment. And we know that was the case by some of the conversation that we hear between God and Moses. Exodus chapter 4 verse 1 beginning, Moses answers and says to the Lord, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord's not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Which, by the way, is exactly what I would have done. <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Moses didn't know his rod would do that. Never had before. But when God chose to use his rod and to use the owner of that rod, more importantly, Moses... For a particular task, he equipped him with that which was necessary to accomplish it. Now, I'm not expecting God to work in my life exactly as he did Moses. But I know God will work in my life exactly as he did Moses in that he will. The content of the circumstances may be different. But God still has work for me to do. He still has work for you to do. And a lot of that is going to depend upon whether we're willing to be disciples to be used by Him or not. Moses learned something new that day about the power of God and His ability to work through Him. After giving Moses two additional miraculous signs to perform, we read in verse 10, Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, Neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. We've all been there and done that. I was a student at Fried Hardeman University, studying to be an accountant, getting a business degree. Married the greatest woman in the world, that's what she thought she was getting. A little bait and switch there, hon. Sorry. <laughs> they had no clue she'd be a preacher's wife. You know why? I had no clue I'd be a preacher. Now, we can debate whether that was a good decision or not. <laughs> and you're certainly welcome to your opinion on that. Now, I understand. But... It wasn't until I was 30 years old, after making a little preparation, that I decided to preach. Now, it wasn't a Moses moment. Well, it was for me. As things developed and things changed, and I'm sorry to use a personal illustration, but you have stories to tell as well. I'm excited about the stories that haven't been told yet. About the good things that are going to happen. You know, I can't wait to hear about those who step up at Indian land, who become leaders and preachers and teachers, and those who serve the Lord, and those from here. By the way, there are going to be gaps here. We need you to step up. We need Gold Hill Road people to get a vision for how they can be used in ways that haven't been used before. God will provide if we'll only provide ourselves. God said in Exodus 4.12, Now therefore go and I'll be with your mouth and teach you what you'll say. 
He also provided Aaron, his brother, as his spokesperson. But you know, later as Moses stands before Pharaoh, it does seem he was a lot more eloquent than he thought he was. I'm not saying Aaron wasn't used in some capacity, but you know, it does really seem to be in the text. Moses was the one who started. He found himself in that process. God knew he would. He knew he would. He overcame his fears, overcame his doubts. Is there something new and different that you need to learn about yourself? Is there a hidden talent, an unmined vein of gold in your life that will enhance your discipleship? What great things for God are not being done sometimes because we fail to, to learn something new about ourselves. Something that we have the capacity to do, to share, to grow into that has not yet been seen. There's also the benefit as we learn forward is to learn about others. The church is the most beautiful, vibrant, important group of people on the face of the earth. Brothers and sisters in Christ sharing a, a common ancestry in the blood of Jesus, a common faith, a, a common love as we sing about from time to time. It is the greatest thing in the world. But sometimes maybe we're not as engaged with one another as we ought to be. Sometimes it is through that engagement that we encourage each other to grow as we're talking about this morning. Maybe we need an Aaron in our life to stand beside us. Maybe we need other people to encourage us, to assist us, to help us believe in ourselves when we have doubts. That's what we're to do in these, just, just do a, a word search of one another, one another, one another. We've studied about it in the past, we will in the future. Just do, do a word search of those two together. And look at all the passages that talk about the beautiful one another concepts in relation to God's people. One of the greatest classrooms of life is the curriculum of others. Romans 12, 4 to 6, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually, members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Use them. Not sit on them. Contemplate them. Ponder them. Talk about them. Use them. Then he begins to talk about a series of things. 1 Corinthians 12, a similar discussion. Beginning in verse 25 of chapter 12, there should be no schism or division in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. We are only as strong as a body as you are supplying your peace. Supplying your part. Now, all of us know what it's like. Have you ever stumped your little toe? Maybe you've broken your little toe before. Now, if you look at that little toe as it comprises the entire weight of your body and the entire scope of who you are, it's just a little toe. It's called little toe for a reason. Just a little bit. But I promise you, you hurt your little toe, your whole body knows about it. Word gets around. <laughs> and the whole body may limp because of that little bitty toe. 
We need to see ourselves, no matter what our talent, what our ability, or where we see ourselves, at least, in the body of Christ. Maybe you're the little toe, but if you're not the little toe we need you to be, we're all going to limp. We're just not going to be what we could be otherwise. We need you for our balance. We need you for the superstructure of our lives, all of the parts working together. Make us the one body in Christ. Thank you for the service you have done and for the service that you're about to do in the Lord's work. Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We need to encourage each other to do that very thing. And lastly, we obviously need to learn about God. We need to learn forward about God. We studied, I studied with the teenagers this morning the story of Zacchaeus as we're studying the life of Christ. And we talked about that setting in, in Jericho when Zacchaeus met him and climbed the tree. And we started the class with the song. You know, we little man, was he? Well, that's a pretty elementary view of the whole thing. But it has its roots in important concepts that maybe we learned when we're very, very small. Now we're able to put teenage application to the decisions made in that text. We're able to make adult decisions based on the implications of that text and what it is to be willing to climb to see Jesus. What it is to see over the crowd. What it is to be willing to to have a penitent attitude and make restoration because of my faith and belief in Christ should I need to, to change things. Obviously, in order to learn about God, we must learn more from His manuscript for life, the Scriptures. When you do this, you've got to be open to the changes that will be expected. Isaiah 55 verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. His thoughts will literally blow our minds. They are so awesome in their, in their beauty and in their requiring nature. He'll ask us to do things that seem to make no earthly sense whatsoever. That's what faith is. That is the ultimate test of faith. In Joshua chapter 6, another account of Jericho. Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king, and the mighty men of valor. Now let's stop right there for just a moment. Jericho still held that city. Say, so, wait a minute, I'm still on the outside, and God says, I've given it to you. God had already determined victory. It was just a matter of the process to get there. That's an important walk of faith. Verse 3, you shall march around the city. All you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. Then you shall do it six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat 
And the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Lord, could you give me that one more time? <laughs> what? That's not how we've ever taken a city before. We're soldiers. We're not marchers. You are on this occasion. The only way they were going to get the city was to do it God's way. Friends, the only way you're going to get heaven is to do it God's way. It's the only way. The army of Israel had to learn something new about warfare. It may be at times that you'll feel foolish in the eyes of your neighbors because you're trying to follow the scriptures very specifically. Make fun of you. Some of the attitudes you have. Maybe some of the worship activities that are engaged in it go, that's silly. Well, at that point you've got to decide who you're going to follow. The opinions of others or the instructions of God. I promise you, these men marching around this city felt silly beyond measure. In the flesh. We've speculated over the years with the tremendous walls that existed there at Jericho that maybe they were subject to the mocking and the ridicule of the, the Jerichoans as they watched them for these days march around. Woo, look at there. Look at these guys. And they, uh, you had to bear it. You had to deal with it. Because it's the way God wanted you to take it. What's the bottom line to this? The power needed to be of God, not of them. And that was the ultimate message they were supposed to learn. Do it God's way. Whatever God's way is in any particular subject is the right way. Always has been, it always will be. We learn from God in that. Don't worry about being foolish in the eyes of others. Connection with this, I love the story about the young boy who came home from church. His mother asked what he had studied in Sunday school. And he said, the Battle of Jericho. She said, well, tell me about it. So he began to tell the story. It involved a battering ram and knocking down doors and ropes to climb the walls and all that. And of course, she looked quizzical and she said, now that doesn't sound right to me. Are you sure that's what the teacher said? He said, no, she told it a different way, but you'd never believe that. <laughs> God does some unbelievable things. Maybe today you need to learn the, the most basic and awesome truths about God. He loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. Wants you in heaven with Him one day, waiting to give you abundant blessings from His bountiful hand. Are you willing today to confess your faith in Jesus? I promise you there's people in the world who think that's the silliest thing in the world for you to do. You need to do it anyway. The threshold into Christ is bathed with His blood. God asks that you're willing to appear foolish in receiving forgiveness of your sins by being immersed into Christ. Brethren, let's together lean forward. Let's learn forward as we march together in the God's service. Can we help you today as we stand and sing?